Welcome to the Developing Dads podcast, episode number 90. We're 10 away from the, the 100 mark, which seems a bit crazy. Um, I still bump into people that I haven't seen in a while saying, are you still doing the podcast? As if I should have stopped by now, because not many people have managed to keep up a, a routine or habit, or whatever you call this. Um, are, you su- are you suggesting that people years. are just waiting for us to fail, Neil? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> people are just at yeah, home perhaps. excited to be like, you know... That's it. The Greenhorns have failed in their pursuit of continuing the podcast. <laughs> it is. I must say it's getting, I think it's just because I'm not spending as much time thinking about ideas and stuff, but I feel like it's getting challenging in terms of just chatting about stuff, but we'll see how we get on. We need to like think maybe, of something for episode 100. Maybe, maybe it's not, maybe, maybe every time we don't need to have a topic. <laughs> yeah, maybe. maybe like we maybe we just, see. we just get on and talk, talk to each other like human beings. <laughs> see what happens because i guess yeah. I, I guess with the topic we're actually putting pressure on ourselves because we think we have an audience like true that have it not like we don't we don't have an audience we get like maybe <laughs> 20 to 30 people listening so like maybe we should just not put pressure on ourselves to have a topic and maybe a conversation for 50 minutes or an hour isn't actually necessary maybe it's just a half hour catch-up when we talk about yeah. our lives because yeah. we are developing dads, Neil. We are, and we do have things that probably can be conversations and can be conversation starters happening through throughout the the week. Anyway, um, this podcast we're going to um, change change things up a little bit, um, and I'm going to take a leaf out of Steve Bartlett's book um, and interview Gordon, a Steve Bartlett style. So to help me with that, I've asked ChatGPT a simple question of, give me some daddy of a CEO questions. <laughs> and, Is that what uh, you've done? You've, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, do you think, do you think, all right, I was thinking about this, and um, bear with me. I was thinking about this, right? So, how many times do you hand write stuff now? Oh, like, ever since I got my Kindle Scribe, like, a lot now. Okay, but prior to that? Yeah, prior to that, nothing. Like, I went years and years without without doing anything. And there's some sort of an art form of that, isn't there? I mean, it's, Definitely. Well, I'm exploring this in my head right now, so whether it, it comes across as uh, an established thought process or not, I doubt it. But, for example, you don't know how to ride a horse. Correct. Does that mean you're incapable of doing, like, going places? Not really, because you can drive a car. <laughs> and I could jump on a horse and try and ride it and get, get yeah. some of the way there. Yeah. So it's going? kind of like, you know, handwriting is now a dying art form, right? I, I wouldn't be surprised if exams start getting taken on a keyboard at some point, right? Yeah. So yeah. You know, handwritten stuff is probably going to start to get rid of. And then now I'm thinking, are we going to get, are we going to, is, is, it, like, is it lazy to not handwrite stuff and type it out? Yeah, I see where you're going with this. Um, it could be seen in some way. Is it lazy to not ride a horse and drive a car? Is it lazy to have an automatic car? Uh, you know, how much of our brain is being used if we're driving an automatic car versus a gearbox? And then it basically expands into this whole thing about <laughs> being a human what, being what and thinking done. about the questions in your own brain, <laughs> coming up with them, questioning them, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent. Know. You know, if we start using AI for that kind of tool, do we become less confident in our own abilities and yeah, capabilities? I mean- it's kind of look, looking at the whole kind of map journey of when you try and get from A to B in a car. Back in the day when our parents used to do it, there used to be a map in the front seat and mum was like was trying to figure out where to go, what road we're on. Dad was um, cursing and swearing because he didn't know where he was going. Now we just stick into Google Maps and it takes us there. There's none of this kind of planning the journey, how long is it going to take us, how many miles is it going to be, any road closures, all that kind of stuff. It's just, it does it for us. And then- <coughs> And then the funny thing about the the funny thing about the uh, the the Google thing now is I don't know if you find it, but I for one I'm okay to allow the Google gods to decide where I'm going and <laughs> how long it's going to take to get there. Right? Anyone yeah. who's over the age of about fifty thinks that they know better than Google, so they are going to like look at oh why are we going on that road? Like why are we going in that direction? What's the point of yeah. doing that? It's like I've experienced Google op- Google operates on a crowdsourced information database that tells you the fastest route somewhere. So, trillions and trillions of data points. And you think you think you're uh, 
A unique road reference understanding is going to get us there quicker. I bloody doubt it. So yeah. that's ones for David if he listens. He loves he loves a good <laughs> he loves a good check out on the old Google Maps. Anyway, sorry. I think it's all in laws. It's all like well, yeah. My my parents in law do it. Um, and our parents my my our, our parents do it as well. Excellent. So do you think do you think you're getting lazier by not just working out your lazier. own questions? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe I am. But am I okay with it? We'll see how this episode goes. <laughs> all right fair enough um so yeah like like we always do in these in these podcasts we I, we check in it's been about a week since we last spoke and um, thankfully it's not on a sunday night that we're doing this podcast so there's a bit of time to get it up um in time for monday upload but like yeah like we always do how's your week been how are things and give me some highlights and lowlights how's my week been i always come to these conversations unprepared and realizing what i've have I organized or not organized um, I finally, I tell you, HMRC, so tax, for those that don't know what that is, um, they phoned me up, right, so I've got a register of VAT, and they phoned me up randomly, bearing in mind I've been, you know, had this process organized for the best part of two weeks, they phoned me up and asked me some questions and then said, what, what was your last corporation tax bill? Now, can you can you turn around and tell the tax man, Neil, what you paid exactly in tax last month off the no. top of your head? No. Zero. No. So I'm like, you've randomly called me and expected me to know something like of detail like that. Like, it's, it doesn't quite work like that, I'm afraid, buddy. Yeah. So um, anyway, he had to get a call back. So then I had to email them on this form, then request a call back. Then they didn't call me back. And then they apologized for not calling me back and said, we scheduled it for this time. And I was kind of like, oh, okay, right, fine. So we uh, managed to get the call back, managed to get it in. So now I'm, now I'm registered for VAT, which is great. But it's just HMRC are, are like dealing with people in a cave. <laughs> um, beyond that, I had a couple of interesting client meetings talking about sort of new projects coming up, running podcasts and stuff. I had a photo shoot yesterday, which was kind of cool, and then I met up with some uh, some old clients that I've worked with, uh, who's recently had 100,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is great, and that's all I can really remember. I've been doing a lot of dad duties as well, which has been nice, like, actually, actually, no, like, this is, this is, this is a highlight, and I keep reminding myself of it, because I still have this internal battle of the whole you know, I want to be productive and provider and whatever else and go to work and earn money and yada yada. But I get my day on a Monday with Olivia and every single Monday it just gets better. <laughs> just gets better. Because uh, we we went swimming. Um, and swimming is great while you're swimming. Outside of swimming, it's a bit of a nightmare because you've got to get in, get changed, find a place. It's a tiny little changing room. You know, you've got to organize the kid, organize yourself, you know, organize other dads that are around you potentially if they're there, that kind of stuff. But it's just so amazing to see her progress in terms of her confidence in the water now. Nice. You know, nice. she like holds onto the side by herself. She kind of reaches for you a little bit. She's paddle kicking and she'll go under and do all sorts of bits and pieces. And ah, just great. And she loves it. She loves the water. You saw her when she was in Sky. She, like, she loves jumping in puddles. Yeah, and, yeah. You know, yeah. so... It's just, it's great. And it's just, I think it's, I think it's nice as well, you know, how at the early stages for every, for every reason possible, like I completely understand, I do, but there's still part of you feels like, you know, I want to, I want to help. I want to do something of the first sort of six to 12 months of, of Olivia's life is very mum dependent. Right. So I did, I did feel very useless and, uh, and I, I was okay. I, I was okay most of the time about it because I understand the practical implications of it all, and I get it. But it's still hard, right? You still want to be. You want her attention. You want her to to love you or to give you affection. But now that she's getting a bit older, and she doesn't doesn't require Laura as much in terms of all of those things, she's now really leaning on me quite a lot. And I think also the time that I'm spending with her, like I get every Monday, and it's very consistent. I think it's it's playing a, a really uh, good role in our relationship and just bloody loving it neil it's just like nice that's just, awesome and, and nice yeah it really is you know I think and it's I, I, under, I, underestimated how much uh 
it's a dedicated day or like I only work four days so I generally have kids free but I work from home as well so I can go to the, I can pick up the kids I can drop them off and just having more time with them yeah the, the, I think you're, uh, people underestimate how much of a benefit that can be in terms of building your relationship yeah yeah well it's you know it's it's like Michael Malcolm Gladwell says that relationships fail not because of conflict but because of neglect yeah. But if we think of the opposite of those things, how are relationships built? They're not built on grand, you know, stupendous, expensive, extravagant gestures. Yeah, yeah. They're they're built on micro events, little things. You know, like when you come home from work, how Rebecca greets you. Yeah. When you see your kids at the gates at school, how you greet them. Like that's all. That's it's all micro little things, and um, although I don't see the I don't see the financial reward in terms of in my bank account, <laughs> my eighty year old self will, or even my fifty year old self, or even my sixty year old self, when and if she does, if she wants to, she doesn't have to, when they come home for Christmas. Like yeah, there's a billionaire. Yeah. I don't know if you have, have you ever listened to a Noah Kagan episode on uh, YouTube. He interviews a billionaire. And he says the mark of a successful parent is if your kids come home for Christmas. Wow. When they're older. You know. So cool. So if Olivia, you're listening to this, right? And you didn't come home for Christmas. <laughs> I invested a lot of time on a Monday with you. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I guess like the week from a professional perspective, good like good month in terms of income and stuff and uh, it's all kind of ticking along very nicely. And um Mon like Mondays are just yeah they're just really becoming sort of cool like just 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 the best. Um, I also actually on the Monday uh, because Olivia not next week but the week after is going to get picked up by one of our friends from nursery and staying over a couple of nights. Um, we're kind of you know getting her used to the the space and whatever else. So I went round uh, to the uh, to the girls that we uh, are friends with and their husbands. Um, as part of my baby and boot bump class thing that we did, uh, I I went round to them because they're on maternity leave. I went round to one of their houses, the girl, the Lauren, who's looking after her, and uh, I had my little kind of you know hanging out with the girls, <laughs> you know, nice. where where it's we it's weird. I did have some trepidation. I was kind of like, you know, what's this going to be like? No, yeah, um, not my dad's do that. I don't think none, Neil. <laughs> uh, and it's kind of bad, right? Yeah, it is because because it, it, you know, if you were on paternity leave, okay, just you, right? Okay, Rebecca went off to work uh, after say three months giving birth, and you are the stay-at-home dad looking after the kid. Who would you go and hang out with? Who would be your support network? Yeah, I know, I know, none. I mean that. Yeah, I, I'd still go to the the the, the baby groups with the majority of mums and stuff, but yeah, it's pretty it's a pretty lonely existence. It, it is, and it, it, it I don't like it's it's our own. We have to make a circumstance ourselves at some point, right? Sometimes there's choices within ourselves that we're making about how we interact and what we choose to do. But at the same time, it's like, well, like men, I I would say that men understand men's thoughts, processes, and issues better yeah yeah you know so it's like that right so when you're when you're in a if you're in a baby and bump class or a uh whatever and they'll be talking about certain things you're like well i don't have a womb and i don't understand <laughs> I don't the differences breasts. of these things you know <laughs> yeah i don't i don't you know what am i gonna do yeah so yeah it's kind of it's quite it's quite interesting and it's not to say that uh anything like lauren and monica are fantastic they're so much fun and we had a great time. It was just kind of interesting, you know, leading up to it. I was just like, yeah, what, what am I, gonna, what am I going to do here? <laughs> you know, do I bring volivons? Is that what we do at the uh, <laughs> fresh baked scones? <laughs> fresh baked scones, a penny, you know. Um, so yeah, it's kind of interesting. But yeah, that's my week, Neil. I've, I've banged on. And then tonight, going around to Harry's uh, to see Robin and Jason, and we're going to have a lovely poker evening. It's our first one in over a year. Uh, I really, I really, really enjoy those evenings. Uh, so we've got one of them tonight, staying over at Harry's, and then we're playing some golf tomorrow morning. Nice. So, to be honest, I'm pretty wholesome. 
per- personal week actually if i was to put this down as like a yeah. an ideal week in my calendar it's been not far off nice nice um my turn now you've been decorating your shelf behind you that's what you've been doing a little I've, backdrop I've, I've been tid- t- tidying up my my office, which makes it seems to be everything gravitates gravitates towards my office if it doesn't fit anywhere else in the house, and I have had enough of it. So I, um, I, yeah, I did a bit of spring cleaning, got my whiskies out, and then I went show. Got my bookshelf here, which is nice. All my books are organised. Um, but th- my week works a lot better than previous weeks. Just I think I don't know, just a busy period. Um, no more firefighting and stuff. So that's nice. I've actually got Friday off, which I've missed. Um, big celebration for Rebecca. She passed her, her exam, her two-hour exam for her course she's been doing for nine months. Boom. Um, well done. Well done. I'm going to send a message ni- right now. <laughs> 95% in her coursework. So, she so had, can, I, can I congratulate her? Because I wasn't allowed yeah, yeah. to say good luck. Yeah. Um, so yeah, she did 16 projects and yeah, got 95% out of her coursework and 85% out of the exam. So yeah, she's smashed it. Now building up a portfolio um, and looking at like volunteer jobs. So like there's this website that's kind of like for freelancers that want to get a portfolio and experience. You can volunteer for stuff. So yeah, really proud of her. We marked the occasion by going out to a restaurant with the kids yesterday. Just a bit of a celebration, which was really nice. Um, Went for a run this morning, which was nice around a loch. But all the kids have got coughs. So it was a bit of a rough night last night. Just hearing them, just coughing. Their, their yeah, we've up. got coughs. It's, it's, it's see, we're trying to sleep through it. Oh. <laughs> and you're like, are they, are they going to be sick? I don't know. I mean, you just let them lie in it, no? <laughs> yeah. So that was, um, yeah, restless night, but I managed to get get a run in with Graham this morning around Loch Orr. And what else? I think, yeah, the highlight was Rebecca Fibb passing her test. She was very, very nervous about the exam. It's the first exam in like nine week, nine years, ten years. How how do you feel how do you how do you feel about celebrations? Like I feel like the I feel yeah, part of me feels like as an adult you just get a bit more conservative and a bit more comfortable, so you just kinda of do the thing, right? Whereas I I also don't feel like I celebrate as much as I maybe used to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I think it's important to. So yeah, like, I think it's super. I think it's super important. Like, really mark, like, mark the occasion and be yeah. like, make a massive deal out of it. Because yeah. I just think it becomes so far and few between when we become adults. There's like, we don't do exams. We don't. Um, we we also dampen down successes a bit more yeah. because they may not seem as you know as big as they were. Like Olivia jumping off a step is like one of the most incredible, greatest, greatest things she's ever done. You know, whereas we don't really have those things really happen to us as adults as often. So, yeah, I, feel like I know what you mean. Properly celebrating, you know, like really marking it. You go out, you have an experience, you do a thing. Um, I guess why I guess why I kind of I really cherish birthdays now, especially um, especially Laura's birthday in particular, is I I've I've often tried to go a little bit above and beyond because it's only once a yeah. year, right? It's a big it's a big moment. Um... Yeah, every kind of job promotion or change I've had, we've always celebrated with a meal. Like I invited some of Rebecca's friends around on Wednesday night when she found out she passed her exams. So we had like champagne, we're pop, um, prosecco, not quite kind of for champagne yet, but <coughs> had some prosecco um, with a few friends around and stuff, which was nice. Mum and dad came over. Um, so yeah, really just trying to mark the occasion and uh, make her feel feel good, and she deserves it. It's um, it's a big. It's a big undertaking. Like it's a it's a tech role. She'd never done any kind of computers before. She's now a UX designer. Um, in terms of the title of the exam, so yeah, it's it's exciting. Boom. Um, and that's it, really. Like standard standard week weekend. Not many plans. Um, toying with the idea of going out to the pub with a friend, but just feel a bit sorry for myself with lack of sleep. So I'm like, if I go out, have five six pints tomorrow morning, I'll be pretty rough. I don't want to be that. I don't know. When was the last time you saw your friend? Last week. <laughs> so it's not. Yeah, we were. Um, was it last week? Maybe two weeks ago. Went to Edinburgh Fringe, but yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Why, not, why, of... not, why? Why drink alcohol? Why not just have diet coke? I know. That, yeah, that could be a plan B. That could be a plan B. Because I had I had one recently when peers. where I didn't drink. It was a it was a my creative mentorship barbecue thing I did. I didn't drink. 
It was a weird, it, it weirdly weird experience not drinking at a barbecue. Why I did woke you up, not drink? Uh, not many. Not anyone else was really drinking because everyone else was sort of driving. Ah, oh, okay, fair. So it was kind of more of a collective thing. And I was like, I felt really fresh. I like, woke yeah. up fine. The yeah. house was clear. Like I had a nice time. You know, it's kind of interesting. I don't like. I don't not like. I like alcohol. I like drinking. It's fun. But at the same time, I'm like. Is it as fun as the hangover? Yeah, uh, no. maybe. I'm not going to stop drinking. I, I don't know. But to me, it's just kind of like that. It was kind of interesting. I just find it always interesting. Like, it's like, oh, let's go for for drinks. And you're like, well, can't I just drink Diet Coke? Like, I'm all right with that. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know. Maybe maybe, that, maybe I just need to commit and do that because the social occasion would be nice to catch up with them. And yeah, or you might, you, and you also might discover it's just really boring. I mean, you listen to podcasts, so I definitely can't admit that. So, so maybe he is boring, man. There you go, right? So you just what you're saying is you only go out with him to drink. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um. Anyway, the topic topic of this conversation was um to delve into Mr. Greenhorn a bit more because like we haven't we've probably done introductions throughout the kind of episodes, but we haven't done a full episode on on you or on on myself. So I thought. Be quite a good one just to delve into your childhood, which obviously I know about, but we can share with the, the audience in some kind of pivotal moments you might remember. Um, and we'll go into your later life. <laughs> what are you saying? Is this like a? Is this is what's it? This is a story of you. What's that old uh, old TV program where they they wrote a book for you about your? This is your life. Oh yeah. Maybe okay. Is that what we're that. going to be doing? Yeah. All right. it's, it's, it's more I don't, I don't know if you listen, how many episodes you listen to Diary of CEO but he always starts with the childhood he always starts with like give me some pivotal moments in, in your childhood that have made you who you are today <laughs> he loves doing he loves doing the kind of cliche like psychology sort of uh, what, you, what yeah. you think a, a psychiatrist would do to you you'd be like who are you abused as a child <laughs> yeah. give me some no. stories does that ups- does, what does that feel like does that does that, does that upset you <laughs> but it made you a CEO. Um, anyway, how was how was your childhood? Give me some some highlights, some things you remember that are maybe unconventional. Unconventional things about my childhood. Well, we 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 I I'll just go I. Who cares? I uh, I was educated in a school with twenty four children. Yeah, that's pretty. That's pretty major. Pretty tiny, you know. Considering Isla's class prim- is thirty just now, right? <laughs> so I was in a I was in a school that was smaller than that, right? An entire an entire school. So I guess that's a very unique kind of upbringing, where it's probably much more community led. Uh, not that not that our parents were that sociable, <laughs> to be honest. Like, I don't remember <laughs> hanging out with many of the kids. Um. And we used to always have to get like a bus to school, you know, even at primary school and secondary school where it, you know, you're a good 45 minute hour long commute yeah, there and back, you know, because we lived, we lived so rurally. Other unique aspects of my childhood, you know, we grew up in a farm where there was no like, no gas supply or any mains water supply. So every every year if it rained a lot then we'd have to get tap water i would have to get bottles of water because the uh the taps would go all brown and horrible uh i did i think i did get salmonella or something or e coli or something at some point and <laughs> it was pretty serious like i was uh i was defecating oh. blood which wasn't very nice I, was, I remember i remember that being very painful i can remember sitting on the toilet when i was a kid and i was wow. screaming so sore yeah, that's quite uh, yeah, something to like. I, I've I've obviously had illnesses and and broken bones and stuff, but I don't think it sticks out that much in my childhood. Yeah, I remember sat on the toilet. and Mum was at the other side of the door, just telling me it was okay, and I was like, it was so sore. <laughs> Genuinely, it's terrible. Like salmon, I was bad. People die from that shit, Neil. Yeah, I, Isla had it from her yeah. school. It traced back to her school. Yeah, roasting. Um, what are unique aspects of my childhood. Do you think being brought up in a in a smaller school benefited you, hindered you? I mean, I'm pretty socially inept anyway. So even if we'd had more kids there, I don't think it would have made it better. 
Would you have so, been socially inept if if you were brought up in a bigger school? Uh, it, but it, but the thing is, it's not it's not because I. It's it's not because I uh, was limited in the amount of social interaction I would have had. It's like twenty four people, even if it's only seven that are the same age as me, it's still not an unreasonable amount of interaction, right? Yeah, true. So there's, there's something else about the social ineptness that that uh, that ultimately uh, would drive that more than necessarily just having less less interaction. Um. But no, I think I think it was actually better because you know if you think of how if you think of the most influential people in your life, they sometimes are your parents, but probably not because you don't really spend that much time with them, especially the two working parents. You're spending more time with your teachers, right? Yeah, like a hell of a lot more time, like maybe six to eight hours a day with with these teachers. So. I think that because you have a smaller school, like a primary school like that, a tiny little one, then you just get so much more time with the teachers, right? So yeah, yeah. I think there is probably a benefit, especially if they're good. If they are good teachers, I think my teachers are good. <laughs> Can't remember most of them. I mean, I remember Mrs. head Russell. teacher Mrs. Russell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mrs. Morris, I remember her. Mrs. Morris, yeah. She had a very tragic, unfortunate thing with her son, who died yeah. from an overdose. Um, sniffing glue. Um, I guess it was quite sheltered as well. You know, there's there was rarely any bad children as such because obviously there's the the more you scale, ultimately the more chance you are going to have of someone who's you know either has a learning difficulty or is uh, troublesome at school or whatnot. We didn't really have anyone like that. There was no controversies of like kids getting stabbed or set alight or <laughs> something like that. Yeah, um, yeah. So I guess that was kind of a benefit, but then it, at the same time, you weren't really exposed to if you say something that's inappropriate or someone takes offence to you, you get punched in the face and you quickly re- you're quickly reminded that you maybe shouldn't be saying that. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. So I guess that was kind of a unique benefit, and then I guess also that I didn't learn to drive until I was like twenty eight or something, twenty seven, twenty eight. So I cycled everywhere, and it was such a beautiful place to go cycling. You know? yeah, I remember you and your BMX, like yeah. no gears, tiny wheels, going out massive hills. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It used to be pretty fit. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I guess that's is that unique enough for childhood stuff. Yeah, I, I think it is. Um, is it, what would you say? And this can go into kind of uh, late teens or high school, secondary school, whatever you call it. Um, was there any kind of significant challenges you faced during the during the kind of School years or going into early adulthood, moving to London, that kind of thing. Uh, that's quite broad, but I guess, I guess the one that stands out from school, secondary school, was the transition from standard grades, which is effectively like English A levels, A levels, no GCSEs, and hires, which are A levels. The transition of that sort of fourth year in secondary school. I don't know what year that is. Year eleven or something, twelve or something in England. This is one thing I'm going to have trouble with, Neil, because I have no idea about what the hell the English te- uh, education system is. So uh, that transition between some people went off uh, to college uh, after their sort of uh, final standard grades. Some went on to do hires as a fifth year, and then some did two years of hires on to sixth year. So some went a fifth year after university, etc. I think transitioning from fifth year to sixth year, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. To be honest, I actually feel pretty let down with my teachers at the time because they didn't exactly like kind of, or I don't feel like they directed me. You know, you, you're you're seventeen years old. What that like? What the hell do you know about life and what's yeah. required? You, you kind of some of some part of you needs to be told what to do. Right, go and do that. And I didn't don't think I feel I got that. So then. I just kind of meandered through sixth year, trying to do my hires, failed them all. Uh, I passed them in the fifth year, but the sixth year I failed them all. And it was kind of an odd year because all my mates either went off to uni or they were older, so they went off to uni. And I was kind of in this like disjointed area of, I've got no mates. Yeah. And I knew people at school, but they weren't my friends necessarily. They weren't people that I hung around with all the time. And I was just kind of like, what, what do I do? I didn't really know what to do. I was very lost and 
I had no idea like who my friends were, and I was kind of hanging out with some people, but then I wasn't really because I don't think they either liked me or I didn't really like them. So that was a really weird period of uh, between sort of that, sick, that last year of school where I had no friends, didn't know yeah. what to do. And then you kind of went into the, the um, catering industry and went full steam ahead with that, moved into Thainston and... Yeah, that, and again, that was kind of default, right? It was like, I didn't really know what to do, so I just did something. Yeah. And I enjoyed it, so I just went and did it, and it didn't turn out too badly. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if the guidance in schools is going to be better, because I, I remember when I went, there's there's not much in, in terms of next steps. It's either college, university, or that's it. There's no starting your own company, or building your brand, or... Yeah, I don't, I don't know, I don't know about that. But it was just kind of like, I didn't feel like I was ever, hey, Gordon, have you thought about university? Like, I don't remember yeah. anyone saying that to me. Which, partly you could say, you, you, you could probably say, well, why didn't mom and dad ask me, like, what do you want to do? It's like, I don't remember them asking me what I wanted to do. Yeah. So, I think it was amalgamation of everything. Like, teachers didn't really ask me what I wanted to do. Mom and dad didn't really ask me what I wanted to do. I just kind of had to just figure it out, right? And I guess, you know, thinking on my feet there is that probably lent itself to how I behave now. It's like I don't really ask permission to do things. I just go ahead and do them. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that, that, that does stand yourself in good stead as you get older, doesn't it? Because you can't, you, you, you can't, be, you can't continuously ask people for permission to do things. You have to yeah. go out and just just do it. So, I guess part of that uh, stand out stuff like moving to London. Yeah, is pretty pretty big. But then even then, I didn't I didn't think of it as that big. I think I was mid twenties, and for some unknown reason, I was like, "Well, if it doesn't work out, I'll just move back home." <laughs> yeah, I think your your appetite to risk. I found that in my twenties, my appetite to risk was a lot bigger than it is now. I guess that comes with a lot of different things with um, responsibilities now with kids and, and a wife and stuff. But yeah, you didn't have much to lose, I guess. Appetite to risk, I find, yeah. So appetite to risk can, like, you can be a riskier person. So, so okay. If, for example, I'm 24 and I'm moving to London, I don't have any savings, I don't have any kids, I don't have a relationship. Like I've got, I've literally got nothing to lose. Yeah. So then the risk, there isn't a risk. Like, you, what are you losing? An intangible yeah. feeling, like a, an intangible feeling, right? You can't, it's, it's, it's not really quantifiable. It's just, I'm a bit sad. It didn't work out. Okay. Well, yeah. People, people get over sadness mostly, most of the time. And then equally, e- equally now as well. So, how you how you evaluate risk is is largely down to how much money you've got in your bank account. So if yeah. if you if you have if you have a hundred thousand pounds in your bank account cash, you could quit your job for two years. Like are you telling me you're not going to make any money in two years? I doubt it. But it gives you so much freedom to be able to make a decision on something. So it's like, is it a risk? I don't yeah. I don't think so. I think it's actually it's a, it, you're at, it's actually worse that you're not doing something about it, especially if you're very unhappy. Yeah. I, I don't know how that I don't know how that kind of thing is perceived by other people. So maybe, maybe people can let me know. No, but, I, I definitely see. There's a I, I feel there's a link between how much money you've got in the bank to the level of risk yeah, you're willing yeah, to so, take. Yeah, so so if you like you know if if you if you live paycheck to paycheck, then of course everything is at risk. Yeah. Or making a move outside of that that kind of finite or very tight parameter, of course it's going to be risky. Uh, well, absolutely. However, if you've got runway, then it's not really risky, is it? Not really. Yeah. Especially if you can cover all your basic needs. Because of which, of which, even when I was 24, I could cover my basic needs because I knew the income that I was getting from the personal training thing I was doing in London was going to be sufficient. Of course it was. I also backed my abilities and yada, yada, yada. But equally now, equally now, I don't necessarily have £100,000 in my bank, but I could probably make some choices and decisions, A, because of the stack of confidence I have from all of the other decisions that I've made to get to me the point where I'm now, but also I have investments, I have things sitting around that ultimately, if I need to lean on them, I could probably survive for a few years and not have to work. Yeah. Like, that makes risk a lot, a lot, a lot of different, a very different prospect. 
Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, so, in yeah. terms of your your London move, do you think there's anything like how did you feel in your first six months moving to London? Did you, did you know anyone? You kind of yeah, I don't no. know if you, don't know you did. How did I feel in the first six months? I initially felt very adventurous, but it was very I was like a I was like a dog. Right, you know, you know when a dog walks into a new place and just goes sniffing everywhere, and yeah. maybe takes a piss in the corner, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. I guess I was a bit like that, where I just I adventured everywhere. I I took a train ticket, you know, just saw everything as much as I could, did everything. I quickly realized that was expensive, and uh, travel costs in London are not cheap. So I'd spent basically, I was like fifty fifty quid I got for a voucher from leaving Nuffield Health. I spent that within like four days. Yeah. So then that was quite expensive. I think the cultural shock was pretty hardcore. You know, I come from the North East of Scotland. I went through my entire school year and I think we had one Asian kid. <laughs> yeah. Right? It's not like it's not it's not a diverse uh, place or space from skin colors to cultures to backgrounds to viewpoints to thought processes everything. Most people are pretty much the same. Yeah, even career choices and like or industry you work in, it's all very linear. Everything horizons they're all, they're all kind of pretty pretty limited, and that was quite a big shock. Like I moved into an area that was largely uh, largely an Asian population, so when I would ever get on a bus, I was the only white guy on the bus. And did you know that before you took the no the keys? no idea? No. no, because you're naive, right? You're yeah. because you're you're not you're a naive young man. Who, who is a bit travelled? Like I understand the world to some extent and the things that go on in it, but it's very different when it's in your in the same country. And it's not that I had a negative uh, connotation to it; it was just very different. It's just different, uh, and I don't I don't have much more to say about, um, about that. But that's just kind of what it was. It was very much a cultural shock. And then there's also the busyness. Like I remember in Aberdeen, you'll know this, Neil. You know, you get to the bus stop. You stand at the bus stop, the bus comes, you look around. Who is here potentially first? Are they going to get on first? Is that their bus? And you look at them and you kind of acknowledge them and they say, no, it's not my bus. And you get on, you get on, get on the bus, right? In an orderly fashion. Yeah. Now, when you have cultural differences and busyness, people don't do that. However, I proceeded, certainly within the first couple of weeks, to like, you know, let people on the bus that were there first. However, what that meant was, if the bus was busy, I didn't get on it. <laughs> Yeah. So, so a large part of like the whole uh, that whole thing was like a big culture shock. Um, from there, it was quite unstable. I think for a large part of the the time in London, it was like a landlords wanted their properties back. Uh, I couldn't find one. Moving around a lot, I was kind of smacked in the face a lot with how expensive these kind of things were uh, for what you got. Living with people I didn't know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that that was a real kind of a bit of a struggle. Uh, and then adapting to a new work, new work environment, a new thing, new people. It was a lot, all at once. Um, but yeah. Any, like what, what, any kind of big decision make, decisions you had to make in the first kind of year or two in London? How you, where I was going to live. Yeah. Where I was going to live was hard, especially as well when... A lot of a lot of London living is based on shared accommodation, and you have to make a split decision on when you meet them, maybe twice, if you're going to live with them. Yeah, not so easy. So some of those didn't go so well. Uh, other big decisions, um, job wise, you kind of moved from being employed. Yeah, to... I guess it again, again, like in a weird, in a weird way, I. I from risk and like how large or small a decision is, I think I don't really see that see it like that. Like I don't sit down and go, "Oh, this is this is a big decision. Like this is a big thing to do." I just go, "This is the thing to do. This is the right thing." Yeah, not even the right thing. This is just the thing to do. This is what I'm going to do. It's not how, a big how, decision. How do you weigh up though? How do you? You must have some kind of process to. Uh, how do you weigh it up? So. Let's say hypothetically, just in case. This is a hypothetical <laughs> conversation. Let's say I'm working somewhere and a certain percentage I'm getting paid and then the other place gets the rest. 
and then you realize that the relationship is with you and not the place that you're working why why are you giving why are you giving them yeah two thirds of your income you're doing the work sure you're getting no value from them sure they're doing the marketing they're paying the electricity bills yada yada etc cetera, etc cetera. but there's also a large portion of that that's going off to someone else's pocket so how do you weigh that up well it's quite simple really isn't it you don't quit you just go well that's not nah see you later yeah yeah so so from my perspective it's like i'll weigh things up just thinking at it like that and that's what i did and you know it comes back to your your view on risk i guess as well because that was a risky thing to do especially in london a few years in yeah yeah maybe it was but like what sometimes i also think to myself like what's the alternative if i stay here am i happy like where does it lead am i happy you know uh yeah and yeah i guess i guess sometimes i guess sometimes i think about it like when i went from hospitality into personal training you know i went from a job that was paying me a couple of grand a month to 900 pounds a month if i'd actually thought about it that's a terrible decision <laughs> it's a terrible decision because I, I had bills to pay, right? My more, my rent was five hundred twenty five pounds a month. Uh, with bills, I think it was probably at six fifty, maybe seven hundred quid. So I had two hundred pound a month left over for food. Yeah, pretty. That's a pretty bad decision. So sometimes <laughs> I just sometimes I just go with it because I know I can do it. It's just like I'm like it doesn't matter how much the finances are. It doesn't matter all these other things. I know in my mind I can do this. Yeah. And it's going back to what you said. It's like, what's the worst case scenario? You move back home. You live with, live with your parents. Yep. Yeah. Especially when you're young. Like that, especially when you're young and you don't have a baby, you don't have like all of the sorts of bits and pieces. It's just you. If your parents are still married, if they've got a, a mortgage-free house, you'd be all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's sounded advice. Like, so fast. That's a privilege privileged position right that's not i'm not saying that everybody has that access to it but yeah. you know at least 50 percent of people in the uk their parents are probably still together it's it, a lot of people. It, it, interesting when you see these people that are kind of self-made like steve, steve bartlett's one of them who kind of came up from rags to riches um lived in a council estate parents divorced and... his accent's pretty good what, what do you mean how many people on a council estate do you know speak yeah like so, are you um, thinking his story is a bit, a bit enhanced, or <laughs> who who doesn't like a rags to riches story, Neil? <laughs> I know, no, with yeah. respect. True, true. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I find them those guys. If 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 the story is real, those guys are pretty fascinating um, in terms of how they managed to navigate it with, with not really that cushion or safety blanket to to fall back on. Um, so yeah, fast fast forwarding, you moved to London, you did some PTing, you set up on your own, did some bodybuilding stuff. Um, how did you get? How did you transition from the kind of fitness industry to your creative stuff? What was that? What was that like? And why did you just kind of go? You almost went cold turkey with your with your fitness and your PTing online and yeah. Why why did I do that? Madonna has <laughs> spanned, you know, 40 years, 50 years of music or something crazy, right? Right. And she's she's managed to do that by reinventing herself. You know, the clothes that she wears, the types of music that she sings and produces and puts out there, etc. And I think we all I think we all go through cycles of like 10 years where it's not like I'm not saying you have to have a completely dramatic change, but it's a pretty big change that kind of almost fires more neurons in your head in a different direction. And I guess that's what this was. You know, 10 years of telling people that calories matter and this is how to squat and this is how to do bits and pieces. Arrogant, arrogantly, I felt like I'd learned enough to get someone into good shape, to be able to train them safely and help them build a healthier, happier relationship with their with their bodies and minds and whatever else, right? And the doing more was just building into nuance. Yeah. And 
so that just becomes a little bit boring, I guess. So then I moved into, I started filming stuff, which was myself, and then that just kind of progressed into other people asking me to do things, and then eventually I was like, this is the thing I want to do, so I'm just going to do it. And sometimes you have to kind of go cold, you kind of have to just cut it. You got to cut the umbilical cord. Yeah. Was there any you know? decision making, or was it just kind of came to a natural end because of COVID? It comes to or... money. Like, I'm earning more money doing one thing than the other. Yeah. And one thing's taking up my time, so maybe it's maybe we should just let it go. It's done. Yeah. You know, um, and I think as well when you go cold turkey and you just kind of play around a little bit in the background for say a year or two, I think what it also allows is for people to forget about what you were doing previously, or it allows like a a, a breathing gap for you to reinvent yourself. Yeah, you know, because if someone asked me now if I saw them from school and they're like, "Oh, you still doing the bodybuilding thing?" You'd be like, "Nah, nah, I don't do that anymore. I'm finished now." It feels less awkward when it was like when I'd just decided to make the decision of quitting. Yeah. Or not you, doing it anymore. You've now got a concrete base and yeah. you're you you've proven that you're you're successful in, in the creative kind of side of things. Yeah, so that's that's kinda of been it. And I think I think it's just it comes down to like enjoying things, I guess. That's kind of why I went down that route. Um and even now there's some evolution in it, like bits and pieces that I'm doing. But yeah, I think it it just simply came down to reinvention. I think, and if if you can reinvent yourself and uh, continually like make moves in different directions, they ultimately have to pay off. Like you can't just continually just bet in certain directions. But I yeah. think you get what I mean. It's like if you know once you've got to your certain stage in your and your business and what you're doing, Neil, I'm sure there'll be some point at which you'll want to to go and do something else. Yeah, yeah, and I think you're you're right in that kind of ten year mark. If I think of Rebecca slightly earlier than that, but she did the whole mum thing and parent thing for seven, eight years, and now she's she's reached that next chapter in her life. Um, yeah. Last and final question. So you've kind of yeah you went from bodybuilding, created your successful creative business. Um, where where do you see that in five, ten years time? Do you see that this is it for you? Do you see you, it's your creative side is is it, or do you see another? Another so change. I'll be I'll be forty one or forty six. I'll yeah. be potentially four years away from my target retirement. I hope, like I I hope this creative agency thing that I'm building I've sold it, sold it. I've made my number that I want to retire on, and I'm gearing up for that. Nice. That's what I want. And Olivia will be 12 going into secondary school. If another one comes along at some point, then they'll be whatever age, probably still in primary school. But we live, moved, bought a new house. That's the family home for the next 20 years, 25 years, and or 20 years probably. And then I'm good. Then who knows what I want to do? I'll maybe move into an advisory thing maybe i'll just like maybe i'll buy a coffee shop and maybe i'll just open my coffee shop at eight till three every day greenhorn four, coffee four days a week <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. Some, something 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 like that as simple as that nice and then i get to i get to pick up the kids i get to make them dinner uh i get to go to the football at the weekends with laura's dad i get to play some golf maybe yeah, so as I say, your your ten years is very, I mean, close to retirement. So you want to be planning to wind down, slow down, and exit not from like, the company. What, not slow down, and not necessarily wind down. Just, just, just not more, more personal stuff. Yeah, not think about like if I'm working. If I'm working, I'm just doing it because I want to work. Yeah, not like there's still there's still part there's still on my calendar. There's still things that I probably wouldn't do unless it was paying me money. Yeah, like, and to me, that's retirement. Retirement is like I'm probably still going to do something. Maybe I'm doing advisory stuff. Maybe I'm doing some consultancy stuff. And maybe that consultancy stuff pays really well. But I'm doing it even if even if it was even if it was free, I'd still be doing it. Yeah. You know, I I yeah to open up a coffee shop every morning, uh, have a coffee, serve coffee all day. Great. That sounds like a great job. <laughs> 
get to know like the local ceramic makers so they make the cups and stuff get to know the the bakers wow. and stuff and get them to make that and you know hospitality's fun yeah nice well that it's was a, a short, i mean we could easily have done two three hours probably in your life and delved into a bit more detail but we've kept it to about 50 minutes um thanks for listening everyone thanks for listening to the developing dad podcast you can find us on Instagram, Developing Dads. There's not many reels being posted. Maybe today, since I've got a free day, I might start start rescheduling some stuff. Um, iTunes, Spotify, give us a five-star review if you can. Um, and yeah, any final final words think, of wisdom, Gordon? I think on Spotify, Neil, we've got quite a few reviews now. Do we? I don't know how to have a look. My, my phone's uh, in the camera. So. Hold on, let me have a look. Uh, Developing Dads podcast. Remind me, I need to message our uh, our 100, 100 guest person. Yeah, we've got 10 five-star reviews. What? <laughs> yeah, look. Jeez. I'm obviously getting... Yeah, pe- people are listening. Especially to them. 10 five-star? Is there any text? Oh, I can't see. No. There's no, like, comments or anything. Outrageous. Nice. nice. Anyway. Yes, we're famous, Neil. Yeah. We're we're slowly getting there to episode 100. We need to do some, something big, but I don't know what it's going to be. We'll see. All right. Thanks for listening. Energetic closeout, Neil. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Done. Mic drop. Right. <laughs> right. See you there. <laughs>